On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PVS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. All right, everybody, before we get into the episode, I just want to recognize all of our all-star sponsors for the PBS CCS. These companies sponsor all of our events during the year, including winter meetings, any online or virtual conferences that we do, and the podcast episodes. These companies are Momentus, Woodway, Aura Ring, Garden of Life, Direct Fitness Solutions, Proven 4, and Clean Athlete. So again, I just wanted to say thank you to those companies. And with that being said, let's get into the episode. All right, everybody. So this episode of the podcast is going to be another group chat. Uh, We're going to talk nutrition today. But first, I'm going to have the guys introduce themselves. So just anything that's relevant that you guys want to throw in, uh, we'll go Goldie, Jordan, and then Joe, and then we'll hop in, guys. Yeah, I'm Goldie Simmons. Uh, Currently, I serve as the performance coordinator of Chicago White Sox, and I'm going on my fifth year in uh, professional baseball. Jordan Brown, I'm the uh, Midwest League uh, strength conditioning coach, low A, uh, for the Tampa Bay Rays. And I'm in my fourth year of baseball. Hey, I'm Joe Hudson. Uh, this is my fifth year of baseball. I'm the high strength coach for the Red Sox in the Carolina League. Like that. Guys, so like I said, I want to talk nutrition today. And as I was, I was telling you off camera, Um, We actually did an episode of Nutrition Talks, and it was um, some guys in AA and AAA, and we were joking that we should have some guys that were trying to get the same things done in the lower levels and how much harder it would be for you guys just in terms of, um, like, lack of resources in the cities and everything. And so I'm I'm happy to have you guys on, and I'm excited to compare uh, your experiences with the guys that I had talked to on the other one. And so to kick it off, just – what is your role or what was your role in previous seasons uh, in terms of nutrition and supplementation at the affiliates? Um, I can go ahead and kick this off for us. Um, so basically our job up, up until recent was pretty much we had total control of what the guys ate. Uh, we were allotted a budget and basically what we had to do is just kind of manage and and. and divide food amongst 40 people with a small budget. Um, I know some organizations have, you know, greater budgets than, than others. Uh, we were working on like a $400 budget for 40 guys. Um, so basically what we had to do was, was figure out how we were going to manage and divvy, up, divvy out, you know, $100 worth of food every night amongst guys. And at the lower levels, I mean, like you were talking about earlier, I mean, some of these these cities you're looking at fast food right um so it was pretty much just trying to manage and and manipulate the best you could to to feed 40 guys uh with tampa bay we're pretty fortunate that we really are pretty hands-off with the nutrition aspect of stuff um we do have a registered dietitian and then we have for the major league and then we have one that oversees the minor league um and then actually we have another one that does the lower levels. So we're very fortunate where they set up all the catering in the cities. Um, and our sports science intern usually facilitates that by talking to them and setting up the food when it does arrive. So we get pre and post game uh, catered um, for all levels. And it kind of helps keep everything hands off because I have been in the experience before where you know, me as the strength coach would have to go out and buy the food. My first year in baseball for pregame, we only got $75. So $75 to try and feed 35 guys plus three coaches, yourself and your athletic trainer is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, and then our athletic trainer would handle postgame. And I think that was maybe $100, $125, something like that. The next year it went up. And that was helpful for me because I had $125, which is not that big of a jump, but I was able to spend enough to get enough for those guys and have some left over. So I'd always just carry it over to the next day or the next trip. 
Um, and before you know it, I was able to buy more stuff for those guys and more variety that they really appreciated. So that's kind of my experience with the nutritional side of things. Yeah, I mean, very similar to both of these guys. It's uh, pretty much our, our job. Um, I think it takes up a large portion of what we do in the in the minor leagues, uh, especially maybe more so at the lower levels where you might not have as, as many resources with, uh, you know, with clubbies and, uh, you know, chefs, home or road chefs or anything like that uh, that work directly in the, in the clubhouse with you. So, yeah, me and Haye, we – I handle – everything um from pre-game post-game uh snacks on, on the bus everything like that you know we have uh, uh varying budgets throughout our throughout our minor league system based off of, off of need um and, and the other resources that are around so you know it, and like goldie said it's you, know, you get a budget and you, know, you have to split that up between you know 40 42, 43 people sometimes, you know, and depending on how many people you have on your roster at the time, that that, uh, that money spreads thin pretty quickly. So, yeah, you have to get creative with ways to to spread that money out so that we can provide the best. We know nutrition is a, a big deal for these guys, you know, in, in terms of recovery and, and being able to fuel themselves to play a, you know, 140-game season in the minor league. So, so we got to do the best we can. Uh, Jordan, we're really jealous of you that you don't have to do that stuff and, and your hands off. Just, just Lucky to put guy. that out there. <laughs> Lucky guy. Yo, I mean, when I first got there and they were like, yeah, you don't have to deal with food. I was like, thank you. Like, it's a, it's a pain in the ass. But um, I definitely understand what, you know, some coaches across all the other organizations that do have to buy their food. I totally understand, you know, the dilemmas that they run into with you know their limiting budgets and everything like that <clears throat> i think uh i think just to go hand in hand with with that with that topic um uh, as you come in as a strength coach you have various you know various groups of, of players right so you kind of have to part of your job is to gauge the type of group you have you know you have some younger some older you have the the cultural differences things like that so you know as you're going to plan for some of these meals you're kind of looking at you know, these guys coming from the Dominican, Venezuela, you know, the American guys, you know, where they're kind of looking at stuff and they're like, I've never had to eat a PB&J my entire life, but it's about to be like the main course here. So uh, I think part of what we do as well is gauge the group that we have and the culture backgrounds that, you know, that ensue with that. So. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, uh a lot of different things that go into it and then city to city, you know, depending on where you are and what you have access to, it makes a huge, makes it very difficult for sure. Jordan, you're a lucky man over there. <laughs> hey, um, um, I will say that I have seen some weird sandwiches being made in my earlier days. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. I won't we'll go into details. Uh, we can go story for story on the weird sandwiches, I'm sure. Um, before we get too much into the challenges you guys face, because I think that's going to be a really, really big portion of this one, uh, I want to know about the big rocks that you guys are trying to cover with nutrition. Uh, I know it's probably harder at those levels because, um, like you guys said, your, your options are limited and it's a lot of fast food restaurants. But what kind of big rocks are you guys trying to cover uh, in terms of nutrition with your players? Uh, I think one of the biggest things is, especially, you know, we play during the summer, right? So it's, you know, temperatures are at their peaks. Uh, you're just trying to find the best ways to optimize hydration. Um, you know, the foods that are going to help benefit, you know, performance and the heat, things like that. And then the, the timing, the schedule, you know, it's, you basically go to being nocturnal, so to speak. So you're going from playing, you know, when you're in college, you're playing in the afternoon sometimes, whereas you come to pro ball, you're playing at night. So some of the things that we try to, to optimize is, you know, different foods that are going to help, you know, with hydration, um, foods that are going to help performance, you know, as, as the day goes on, gets later in the day, especially with their, their calorie expenditure, you know, we kind of have to be advocates for putting calories in the body. Um, so that was, that was one of the things that, uh, that I kind of highlight, especially down down in the east coast when it gets super hot and it's humid you know you try to optimize you know hydration 
I think one of the other things in regards to hydration is just knowing what players are susceptible to cramping and dehydration in general. Um, I've had a few players where you can just kind of look at them and tell, you know, with how much they sweat and, you know, how they perform later on in the game, like who's going to be more susceptible. So while we do have, you know, certain fruits like watermelon and pineapple that would help with hydration a little bit because they hold a lot of water. Um, sometimes guys just aren't drinking enough during the day. So uh, one of the things I would do, we'd have this stuff called the right stuff and it's really salty, but usually I hand those out to any guy who's really susceptible to cramping or if I know it's going to be a really hot day, um, you know, 90 plus, then I'm going to give it to everybody that's starting in the game. Um, make sure they drink that and then just kind of throughout the game, just check on them, say, hey, how you feeling? You know, do you need anything? And just paying attention to those guys uh, throughout the course of the three or four hours that they're playing. Yeah, I try and hammer home really two things that with the guys that I'm surrounded by. It. The first one is making sure that they're getting – as many meals as they can, you know, complete meals, I should say. Um, I think we have a problem sometimes with guys missing the, the first meal of the day, breakfast, just because of the, you know, the nature of our schedule. Um, you know, guys tend to sleep in it and miss that first meal and then sometimes even push it, you know, depending on where we're at, sometimes push it to, to eat their first meal until we get to the ballpark, which is like 1, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, encouraging guys to get, you know, to get at least three quality meals in. We we shoot for four, five, six, depending on the athlete. But um, you know, that's the biggest one for me is encouraging guys to get all their all their major meals in um, before we really even get into like macronutrients. You know, proteins, carbs, fats, and and what they should be taking in. Is I just try to encourage guys to eat a balanced meal. So everybody has a pretty good understanding of what a carb is, what a fat is, what a protein is. Um, you know, can you build out your plate that has a little bit of all of that on there? If you can do that pretty consistently, then we can start to talk about more in-depth things, you know, nutrient timing, things like that. But, uh, you know, start with the simple things. You know, eat, eat the meals you're supposed to be eating and then make them balanced. And... Most guys at the minor league level will probably, if they have an issue with that, will probably start to see some improvements in their performance anyways. So we start there. That's great. Um, I, have, I mean, I have a few more points I can tack on to those points. Those are great points, by the way. And I think one of the, one of the main things we, we attack is real food, food before, before supplements, you know, and get the guys to realize that supplements are exactly what they're – what they what they sound like you know they're to supplement the essential nutrients that you're supposed to be getting from food so start there first um before you go moving on to attacking the you know the jug of protein and creatine and all that other stuff um just try to get all that stuff through your food your diet first because that's what your body's going to absorb you know the fastest and most efficiently so um and then kind of like joe said just being you know uh, the importance to the hearty meals, you know, and that's where you're going to get your balance and your macronutrients first and foremost. And um, just having the guys understand that like food and supplements, you know, they're for enhancing, you know, sleep recovery and performance. And, um, you know, it's the feel that's going to decipher between your longevity uh, throughout a, a season where it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. Do you guys find that being a, a big thing is like guys just wanting to crush supplements instead of food? I mean, for me personally, I've seen guys like, uh, you know, there'll be pregame meal out and they're like, oh, I'm just going to have a protein shake. And you're like, but we have food out here. And they're like, no, nah, no, no, the shake is fine. I'll do the shake. And like, <laughs> before you know it, it's game time, 7 p.m. And they've had, you know, one glass of water, four scoops of P4 and a protein shake. And you're like, how are you supposed to perform? So I'm, I'm assuming you guys probably see that as well. Yeah. I actually, I don't see it as much as I did, you know, in previous years, uh, guys will make smoothies. You know, we have frozen fruit and they'll, you know, throw some stuff in there with some protein powder and, you know, whatever, you know, crazy smoothies they can come up with, with tons of sugar in it. But, 
that's probably the worst I've seen. But we're, we've been pretty good with getting guys to eat pregame and postgame um, and not having too many problems with guys just wanting to crush, you know, pre-workout and, you know, a, an energy drink or anything like that. It seems to be the picky guys to me. The guys that are the picky eaters, like, nah, I don't really like what we have for pregame today, so I'm just going to have a protein shake. So I was just trying to – you know, sometimes I explain it to guys, like, like you're back in college again. You know, you get, a, you get the same food every day. You know, you just have to get creative with, with what you're making, you know, the type of spread you put together. So, you know, just uh, – look at your options and try and kind of plan ahead of time. Like, okay, you know, we always get, you know, deli meat and peanut butter and jelly and tuna fish. Like I'll rotate through those or I'll get creative. One day I make a wrap, one day I'll you know, grill the, the turkey sandwich, like just to break it up a little bit. I think one of the things I found in over time, and maybe you guys can chime in on this is, you know, like the type of player is changing. Um, and I don't know if this is just like a, like a culture thing, but like you said, guys are very, they're very picky nowadays. And I think, I think that's the college realm for some of these guys. They get very spoiled, right? They have, you know, dietitians and nutritionists that are providing them the smoothie after. So when they come, they get to us and, you know, we don't have those sort of amenities available for them. They kind of get, they get picky and get thrown off and like, oh, they try to go with a safer choice, right? They don't want to make anything on their own. So here they go, you know, just blending up a smoothie because it's what they've had, you know, in the past. And I just kind of, I've seen that over time. And I feel like it's just a, like a new age player mentality where if it's not what I've been used to, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to tap into it essentially. So. I would agree with that. Yeah. 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 Great. I think for you guys, the, the, if that's a big shock. And that was something I saw too when I was in Bristol was, the college kid coming from this big program, right? They got a huge weight room. They got tons of fans at the games. They got unlimited resources. And then they come to the Appy League and their weight room is a concession stand. And there's 19 <laughs> people in the stands and they've all brought their own little Caesars pizzas from across the street. And they're like, where am I right now? Like, what is this? And it's a huge shock. And like you guys said, some of those guys don't have life skills that hey, when I go to the spread line, I can make a decent sandwich with some turkey, vegetables, you know, put the put the bread on like a little griller or a panini maker or whatever, like they're accessible in the clubhouses. And they're like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Like, I'll just, I'll just not eat or I'll just have a shake or I'll just get by. And like, before you know it, the, the schedule of playing every day, they're not used to the travel, they're not used to the the poor amenities that they have, they're not used to that catches up to them. And by the end of August, they're like, oh my God, I'm, I feel crushed. I feel defeated. And it's like, it's, it, it is our job definitely to help support them. But sometimes it's hard to <clears throat> just come in without those, those life skills. And it's like, you never learned how to like make a sandwich the right way or something. It's like a, a lot of those college players will always say that college is so much tougher than pros when they first come in. And then like 35 games in, they have no idea what's going on. And their head just starts spinning. So it's important that, you know, you kind of try to have those sit down or one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and say, hey, this is this is totally different. And this is what you need to do to, you know, fuel your body and, you know, recover and be ready to play every day. Like, this is a different animal. Yeah, so let's dive down into that a little bit and talk about some of the challenges that not only the players have to face, but you guys have to face in terms of, setting up the food and, and Jordan, even your nutritionist and your sports scientist, like setting up the food and all of that. Like, what are some things that you guys have seen that you've really struggled with and maybe how have you overcome those challenges? Um, I think besides, you know, just dealing with the various, you know, culture and, and backgrounds of certain players, you know, come in with, uh, I think the timing, you know, a lot of these guys aren't used to that schedule, the everyday schedule. So when you're trying to kind of hit them with like the knowledge on, you know, what's most effective, what's important, they don't really understand it. And they have to, they have to learn the hard way. And that as a strength coach, you're watching them kind of learn the hard way and, you know, deal with like the cramping and, you know, feeling tired and lethargic and all that stuff. So you kind of have to watch them fail before you can get them to succeed in that, in that regard. So uh, I think that's one of the, the major challenges I've faced with a lot of these guys in the nutrition realm. For us, even though it doesn't, you know, directly relate to me, um, our sports science 
uh, interns, they have to basically observe, you know, who's eating the food. They have to taste it themselves and then they have to rate the, you know, the quality and, and you know, the overall presentation of the food. Um, another thing that they have to do is, you know, make sure guys aren't crushing one thing so that nobody else gets any other thing. So when you have things like, you know, those rare days where you have something real good like mashed potatoes or macaroni and cheese, like something, you know, savory and starchy, like that will be the first thing to go. Um, so that's something that they kind of have to monitor and make sure that there's enough portions for everybody. Um, another challenge that we have to kind of deal with is guys who maybe are like overweight guys and they don't like our post game routine and they're just like well you know f it i'm gonna go to sheets and you know crush fruit from over there and those are the guys we also have to have conversations with because those are the guys that say they want to lose weight but their behaviors don't match up so we try and sit down with them and figure out you know a plan of action of how we can help them um you know whether it be like okay hey like if you don't like post game why don't you make a sandwich instead and bring it back to the room instead of, you know, A, spending your money on sheets and B, buying something that's probably not going to be uh, beneficial for you performance-wise. Um, those are kind of the issues that we run into um, in regards to, you know, the nutrition side of things with our catering and everything like that. Yeah, I think for me, nutrition is like hands down the – most difficult thing I have to deal with on a regular basis like and it's the most time consuming and it's really really just because you know the guys understand I think the players understand that you know the strength and conditioning portion and particularly the conditioning portion but it, it's part of what they need to do and it's more generally accepted that okay like we have to condition as, as athletes um I think that quality nutrition is something that goes a little bit further back in their minds. It's something that they need to do as professional athletes. Um, so that's the biggest battle I, I think I have more so than getting guys, even like guys that have to do extra conditioning, um, getting guys to understand quality nutrition. Um, and let's face it, every single one of us here knows, like, there's not a player out there that won't hesitate and tell you that the food sucks when, when they don't like it. So, you know, you're going to get, you got 40 guys in, in the clubhouse going through the spread line. Um, not everybody's going to like it. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it was T-bone steaks. Somebody's not going to like it, and they're going to tell you about it. So, you know, it, it comes with a little bit of baggage, but, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a good opportunity to, like we, we talked about before, is, you know, having to teach these guys a little bit and, it, and it help guide them and let, have them – you know, kind of struggle a little bit and, and have some failures to learn and grow from it. I think it's the same thing. So, you know, we have to, unfortunately, sometimes I think we have to go through it and, and let them fail a little bit to see that. And, you know, even something like, hey, there's none of that food left and, you know, five guys haven't eaten yet. And those guys are looking for that mac and cheese and it's gone, you know those guys that didn't get it are going to be pissed at the guys that took a heaping pile of it in the beginning. And I think some of those things kind of iron themselves out, but at the beginning of every year um, for the past, I think this is my third year doing it during our big team meeting, right. When we get to our affiliate, that's like the first thing I address outside of like our general strength and conditioning stuff. Be courteous about going through the food line, take a little bit of everything, whatever you're looking for, take a little bit of it just so everybody can get some and then you want to come through again after everyone's eaten go right ahead and then you guys can hash out you know who's going to get an extra serving of this versus who's going to get an extra serving of that but you know be courteous you know, there's 40 guys in here um and that started I'll, t I'll tell you a story on that that started from my first year in pro ball when i was in the pen league my first night we were on the road um first ever game i ordered a post game and guys crushed it went through and there was like eight or nine guys that there was nothing left eight or nine guys were sitting there like there's no food left and we're like two hours away it wasn't a terrible drive but we're two hours away it's 
11 o'clock at night and we're commuting back. Um, what do we do? <laughs> There's nothing to do. So, you know, I, I got chewed out by my manager and, he, you know, it was my first day doing it. And he's like, hey, man, like even like the coaching staff didn't get food either. My manager was pissed off. We lost like uh, we got walked off on. It, it was just like a bad thing from that moment on. I'm like, OK, we will always have enough food unless like you guys are completely inconsiderate. So, you know, that's that's a big thing for me right out of the gate is make sure you take a little bit of everything, but leave enough so that everybody can get some. Uh, just to kind of uh, tack onto that a little bit on the on the other side of the spectrum here, I think, and I don't know if this is another culture anecdote here, but there's a lot of guys that deal with body complexes. And, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, they see people on social media that are like shredded and all this other stuff. And they think that, that that's optimal, you know, physical for their sport. And it's like, no. So I think part of the education process is a, is a challenge with some of these guys because their view on what's healthy and what, what works and what looks best, you know, sometimes is not what's conducive to being a professional baseball player. And we have to go against that, um, you know, with, with the nutrition, you know, some guys, like you said, they won't eat for other reasons. They won't eat because they don't think they see a six pack, you know, so now we're tapping into the mental component, which, which has a, an issue, you know, in and of itself, you know, as far as, you know, being away from home and girlfriend issues, like now they have this to deal with every day, you know, where they see food, they see food and they steer away from it because of their, their vision of what they think is optimal health. Um, so I think that's another thing that, that I, I've seen in the past. Yeah, you're trying to fuel the baseball player, not the bodybuilder. And some right. guys don't realize that they can distinguish between or have to distinguish between those two, I should say. Um, and then kind of going to Joe's point is like one of the things that I have found out the hard way, Joe, is that when we say we're serving 40 people to a restaurant, we're serving like 40 grown ass dudes or like 40 people that can eat, you know what I mean? It's not like 40 general population people where like they might take a small piece of chicken and a, and a handful of green beans. Like these dudes want like three pieces of chicken. Like I got lobster tails and steak for the team one time in double A and I had a guy come up and tell me he ate seven lobster tails. And I was like, <laughs> uh, what did you just say? And he's like, yeah, I don't like steak. So I just ate seven lobster tails and I was like, I, I don't know how, but we ended up still having lobster tails left over, which was mind blowing. But at the same time, that is a big challenge that we have to face is like when we set things up with restaurants, we really have to specify like, OK, when you say 40 people, like, is this really going to serve 40 people for real? Or is it like 25 ish servings that you're spreading thin over 40 people? You know what I mean? So for me, that's been a big thing. Another thing that I've run into and I, I don't know how um how you guys have had to handle it or maybe it's been good for you guys but uh like clubhouse managers clubbies for me sometimes it seems like um they try to do like the least amount like it's always tacos and meatballs because those are cheap and like they can they can hand those out and still maximize the money that's coming in from dues or from other players and baseball is getting towards that like every meal is catered in type of model um so it's taking some of the responsibility away from the clubbies and they're providing like better snacks, better fruit. And it's not everybody, you know, it's like one or two bad apples ruin the bunch. Um, but that is something that I've run into and I don't know, maybe you guys have, maybe you haven't. Um, but maybe we can speak on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, some of the clubbies out there, I think they forget that, you know, that or they just don't understand, right? Like, like these guys are out there all day, every day, sometimes for 12 hours a day. If they play extra innings, it could be longer than that. Um, they really do need, you know, the nutrients that, that are going to be essential to their performance. And, you know, if you get a, you know, an older guy, old school guy doesn't really understand that he's just going to kind of like throw out whatever is available to the guys and just assume that it's going to be enough, you know, or it's going to be, you know, fortified enough to, to allow them to handle the day's prescription. Um, you know, like you said, a lot of those guys, they just try to get away with, you know, next to nothing and, you know, not knowing, you know, the impact that they're going to have in a negative way against these players and their performance. You know what I mean? Like they're already in a, in a bad town. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys are back at the same affiliate they were at last year. So, you know, having a bad club, man, is definitely one of the more challenging things that you'll face 
uh, especially at the lower levels um, where they're just trying to make a buck. And, you know, we understand that, you know, as strength coaches, but they also got to understand too, like, like you said, these guys are, are big guys. They need to eat, you know what I mean? They need to have, you know, the viable nutrients to support their performance. So I think that's a great call right there. Yeah, and it's not to bash the clubbies by any means. Like I said, right. there like, might literally be one bad clubby in the the entire league, and then everybody else is on top of their stuff. But it's that one guy that – and that's the other thing is guys come to you about the food, right? And it's like even if the clubby is providing the meal, they're like, dude, this clubby doesn't care about us. Like his food sucks. Like well, it, it always comes to you. I'm actually curious, Jordan, do they come to you and complain even though you're not the one – setting up the food or do you get bypassed in that process i'm fortunate enough to get bypassed they usually just like to shit on the intern so usually it's the intern that that gets most of the uh the beating so uh, the other three all the three of us are shaking awesome. our heads about that we're all jealous <laughs> <laughs> the best now, days I, for now when i was with st louis if i screwed up they'd let me hear it don't get me wrong so i've i've been there before Oh, man. The best days for me are when we win big, everybody plays well, because then it doesn't matter what we're having for food. The food is good. And it, like Joe said, you can have T-bone steaks, but if the team loses or guys don't perform well, the, the skipper is pissed off, the pitching coach is mad, the players are mad. Before you know it, everybody's like, oh, this T-bone is just not cooked the way I like it. Right? You know, these, just extra these, feel to the oh, fire. Oh, man. <laughs> lobster tails really like seafood what what are we doing like yeah. but if you have that same meal two days later and the team wins big everybody's like let's go capital grill t-bone steaks you know and that's it, it's really funny to see it's it's almost comical at some point like all right when when is somebody going to come up and it's like within the first 10 minutes of post game being out you have one guy come up like hey man this is a great post game let's do this again and you have another guy like we probably should never do this again. <laughs> That's usually how I feel if we lifted, you know, the day of the game. It's if, whether we win or lose, I'll hear about it. So, oh yeah, I'm we've sure. all had those guys. We've all had those guys. I don't lift on day on games, and then they lift before the game. And they hit two homers, and they're like, "I'm lifting every time, every time now." And then they get into lifting, and then they go over, and you're like, "All right, there yeah. goes this lifting routine." He's done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, the thing for me is the – it always blows my mind. You know, you go to one – you go to one uh, affiliate – or not affiliate. You go to one one city in your league and uh, the club is money. You know, you have unlimited whatever you need and just covered in the dues. And then you go somewhere else and there's, like, one loaf of bread and, like, PB&J – and we're like, hey, can we get some more here? And they're like, no, it's already like that's all like your food cover. Like, there's just such a spread between the two, like the two ends. And we have, we're lucky. We have an awesome clubby at at home in Salem. And there's a there's one affiliate or uh, one um, team in particular we travel to that the the clubby the visiting clubby is like unbelievable, and it's all like. You know, anything you need is provided there for you. And then you go, there's another affiliate in particular where there's like nothing out. I just, it, I just don't understand, it, you know, where that disparity comes from, you know. Yeah, we all have this city that like we look forward to going to because we know that the food's going to be awesome. And then we always set, we have that one that we're like, oh, we're going here again. All right. <laughs> Stretch in, boys. It's going to be a rough couple of days. Trying to be to be the punching bag for the team yeah how about like with latin players especially for you guys a lot of those guys they haven't been in the states very long and haven't been exposed maybe to like american food culture or anything like do you guys have issues with that and do you try to mix latin food in when you can um i don't know how available it is in some of the cities you guys go to but how do you guys deal with that aspect of it? um i think that goes back to like the, the budget you know what I mean like yeah you can always throw like rice and beans stuff stuff that they may be accustomed to in there um but I think that goes back to the budget you know sometimes 
you know, you don't have the viable resources to kind of contribute to that culture. You know what I mean? So they're almost forced to adjust to the, the American lifestyle, uh, which is another challenge that we face, I believe, you know, as performance coaches um, dealing with nutrition because, you know, they've been eating something. They come from the Dominican. They come from the academy. Uh, they've been exposed to pretty much like five meals of the same stuff, right? So they come here and it's different. You know, they end up, you know, having issues with bowel movements, things like that. Stomach's always hurting. And you know why, but there's, there's really no way to really fix that um, unless you have somebody that cooks Latin American food. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you deal with those variables with those guys. And I see it all the time. You know, these guys come in trying to adjust to our food just like we would, you know, if we went to the academy and ate their food. You know, you know that, you know, their bowel systems are, are going to try to adjust as fast as they can, whether they like it or not. It's just part of that process. Um, they, they're, with the food that we get, you know, it, they are, you know, they're picky about it. You, know, you just kind of try and guide them through it. Um, from what I've noticed, you know, they like a lot of sweet stuff. So they'll go for the fruit. They'll make smoothies which would just be like milk, banana, and as much sugar as possible <laughs> that they can put in the blender. Um, but there are some things, you know, that they do enjoy eating, and those are the things that are, you know, usually crushed. Um, the mashed potatoes, um, you know, chicken, you know, things of that, things that are easy that they can, they can eat and they digest and familiar with. Um, but usually, like, maybe – once a month at the affiliate, we might get some type of Latin inspired dish if the city, you know, has something that we can get um, just so that, you know, they can kind of eat something that they're accustomed to. Um, now, when we're at the facility, you know, for spring training and, you know, camps and things like that, those types of meals are have a little bit more often. So it's a little bit more of a comfort thing for them. Yeah, I tried this year. Uh, I tried something new where I would, before we went on our on our trip, we I would call ahead and I would order out all schedule out all three four days worth of food. I'd post it on a menu in the clubhouse right when we got there while we were setting up all of our stuff. I'd tape up what we were gonna have, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What was pregame? What was postgame? Where it was coming from? So guys could anybody could just look up at it and then see what we were, you know, planning on having throughout throughout that series. Um, one, it eliminates a ton of questions about what we're having for spread. But two, it gives guys an opportunity to see what they're having, see what we're having that night. And if it's not something that they might particularly be interested in, um, then they can kind of plan ahead and grab something, bring it in, um, bring it with them or something like that. So I got a lot of good feedback on that. And I think it helped eliminate some of those issues of like, you know, not liking food um, because they could see what was going on. And the other thing I, I think, you know, I've, I've been at the same, the same affiliate for the last three years. So I, I've developed relationships with a lot of the places that we cater from. And I know depending on what city we're at, we're, what types of food we can get. Um, but I'll say there's always at least one Latin that knows where there's a barber shop and some sort of like Dominican restaurant, right? <laughs> so you figure out who that Latin is and then you communicate with them on that. Um, so I, I would do that with, with a couple guys that have been around a little while and, and they would know where, uh, where those places were. So I, I'd get with them and ask them, Hey, you know, was it good? You know, did you like it? Sometimes they like it. Sometimes they were like, nah, it wasn't my favorite place. Um, if they, they recommended it, I would try and mix one of those meals in during, um, during the next series we were there. Um, so kind of planning ahead on that. And I would, I would even let them kind of like handle some of that. Um, you know, Hey, we need enough for 40 people. And, you know, going back to the whole uh, serving size thing, like when you order a lot in food, you don't have to worry about like the portion size, like there's going to be enough. If you say 40, they'll give you enough for like 60. Um, but I would let them kind of handle that a little bit too. So 
and be like, hey, can you call? We need, you know, if you guys want this, this, and this, like call, order this, and this is what we have for, this is what I'm giving you for a budget on that. And I would like kind of work with them on it. So they could, they could help me, but I could also get them accustomed to ordering things as well. Um, so we, we had a lot of success with that. But the interesting thing is, um, you know, you order, say, one Latin meal a week. All the American guys are like, oh, we're having Latin food. And it's a good learning opportunity for them or a good teaching moment. Like, to flip the script on them and go, hey, well, they're eating food that you guys like, but they're not accustomed to the other six days of the week. So I actually think it helps out a lot with um, some of that uh, intermingling a little bit of, of the different cultures. Um, I always enjoy it because I think there's uh, – I think there's a lot of like lessons that can be learned in, in you know trying different things and I really encourage guys to try it like you know regardless of what it is or who you are like something might not look good like give it a try if you don't like it you don't like it but you know don't just not try it because it doesn't look good because it might be really good actually so um I think it's opened a lot of doors for us for a lot of the guys we've had over the past couple of years but that's a that, that was probably I think the biggest adjustment I made this past year was posting that menu. It made it made things a lot easier. I think just to kind of go along with that, I think one of the notes on here was was buy-in. I think a like an awesome way to establish buy-in, especially with the Latin community, which is, as we all know, that's tough to do sometimes based on the culture that they come from, is do it through food. I know this might be a little bit outside of the nutrition scope, but Sometimes if you can provide them with what they want a little bit, you know, allow them to listen to their music, you know, provide them with the food that, that, that they want, you know, sometimes you get a little bit more on the back end with these guys when you ask them, you know, whatever it is you need them to do for you. So that's awesome. Yeah, Joe, I'm with you, man. Uh, I actually had a few guys this year that would come to me everywhere we went. Hey, there's this good Latin restaurant. Can we get some food from there? And I would be like, yeah, sure. I have this much money. You know, I'd sit in on the phone call with them. Let's make it work. And for me, that, that got me a lot of brownie points with those guys because they're like, oh, we can order what we think the team is going to like. And he's letting us help it, help him with the situation. Like he's humble enough to, to let us help, you know, instead of, you know, this white guy calling us a Latin restaurant being like, I need just straight rice, chicken and beans. Like they, they would order like chicharron and things like that, that, you know, okay, maybe it's not the most healthy food, but at the same time, everybody loved it. And truth be told, like, all the American guys, at least this year and in the last couple of years, have really loved when we get the Latin food. And it's to the point where, um, honestly, the best Latin restaurant in, um, in our league is in Rochester, New York, of all places. And every time we go to Rochester, two-thirds of the team is like, only get Latin food for post game. Don't get anything else. And I'm like, you tell me we're going to eat Latin food three nights in a row and nobody's going to complain. And they're like, we won't complain. And honestly, those are like the very few times where guys don't complain about the food. Like they love the chicken. They love the rice. We get pork one night, chicken one night, and then um, like empanadas one night or something different. And they love it. And, and like I said, having those guys involved in the process has really helped me as well. Um, get that buy-in because you know like Goldie said sometimes they they don't trust you they don't believe in you they and the more that you show them that you're with them the more they accept you into your into their family and once you're in the family in the, in the Latin culture it's like we'll do anything for this guy you know what I mean like if they're playing their music in the weight room and, and you're singing the songs with them or you're kind of you know showing them like hey I'm interested in this music then they're they're all in on you so any way that you can help get buy-in and even with American guys too just having those conversations of Hey, how was the food? What do you think we could do better, you know, next time? Because like we said, that that criticism is going to come and it's really frustrating and, and annoying at times. But if you just face it head on and you're just there and they're like, the food sucks. And you're like, all right, how can we do better? Like that helps you get that buy-in from those guys instead of them always, oh, he knows the food sucks and he's hiding in the office. We can't say anything to him. Like make your face shown and make your face present and let them complain to you. Sometimes they just need somebody to vent to and it has nothing to do with the food. It's they're over their last 10 or they're having, you know, trouble at home. And like, if you can just take that and wear it a little bit and like they can just vent to you and then, okay, we're good now. Like 
it, I think it builds that relationship and it makes it even stronger between the, between the two parties. So maybe that's just me, but just from my own experience, that's kind of what I've seen. No, definitely. I, I used to take so much offense when somebody was like, it sucks. It would like really take it to heart. And then, you know, once you kind of like put your ego aside and you're like, okay, well, let's hear why. Like, I thought it was a good meal, but why didn't you like it? Oh, well, X, Y, Z. Okay. Well, now we've learned something new about it and we can kind of like make an adjustment in there. But I think everywhere I go by like the 30, the one third rule, like, one third of your guys are gonna say it sucks. One third of your guys are gonna be like, that ah, was fine. And then one third of your guys are gonna come up to you and be like, this is awesome, we should get it again next time. And that's pretty much how it's gonna be everywhere you go. So. And that's a fact. Okay, so I kind of wanna dive into this a little bit further than we're, we're talking about like having guys help us order food and uh, like setting up menus ahead of time. What other advice do you have for others or maybe tricks of the trade to help uh, other strength coaches be successful when it comes to the nutrition at the affiliate? Um, if you want, I can run through just uh, the list that I kind of made in this regard is I think it'll help a lot of, um, you know, strength coaches and strength coaches to be. Um, and one of the first things um, I put down was, you know, the quickest way to build buy-in and discipline is through just educating your athletes, uh, whether it's nutrition, strength conditioning, you know, the more that you can share, the more that you can prove why with certain things, you know, the less that the question, you know, and sort of run away from you uh, when it comes time to get them to do what you need them to do. So basically just being able to share the why with things with them, it'll, it'll enhance buy-in and it's adherence to the program or whatever it is, nutrition front um, that you put in front of them. Um, and then I would just go ahead and say, with that information, just go ahead and plan ahead. You know, find out, you know, what various clubbies, you know, we go, we went back to the clubbies, you know, if you reach out to these guys, like, ahead of time, you know, you'll be surprised at what they're willing to do for you in advance. If you reach out to them and give them, you know, a week or two uh, notice and let them know you're coming in, how many guys you have, what kind of budget you have, you'll be surprised at what they're willing to do, even if they're quote unquote, you know, a bad clubby, you know, they'll at least make an attempt to reach out and, and help you out as best they can. Um, and then the last thing I put here is uh, just practice what you preach uh, to, ma to maximize athletic performance. You know what I mean? If you're a guy that's in the weight room every day, you show them that you're eating healthy, that you're being an advocate for your body. Um, the more that they're going to respect you, uh, especially when it comes to the nutrition front. So just being an advocate for yourself and allowing them to empower themselves and being an advocate for themselves in the nutrition front. Uh, I think those are all pretty good points. Um, just to kind of build off the nutrition aspect of that, I think doing a survey of what guys like and even a, you know, a post meal survey of, of the food, I think can really help not only with the credibility, just because now you're asking their opinion on, Hey, what's, what's beneficial. And this is kind of building off of what Joe is saying, how one third is going to like what you do. You know, one third is going to be indifferent to it and one third is going to hate it. Um, I think if you have more concrete evidence of what people like and what people don't like, and you also take it to your clubby or, you know, the team of nutritionists, or if you're the sole, you know, um, responsibility in that, I think it just helps you out a little bit more to tailor the food around them as best you can within your budget. And, you know, builds a little bit of credibility to show that you are listening to your players and you do care about um, some of the things that they want to see within their program yeah hey hit me with that question again no we're just asking for uh like advice for others to have success in the future you touched on like posting the menu um is there anything else that you're doing that's just helping you succeed um with players in regards to nutrition yeah i think um the, the posting the menu thing was a was definitely a big step for me this year uh, I think it helped kind of open up the conversations a little bit more but um, like Jordan said figure out what guys like um, you know I, I've been at the same affiliate so I I understand where we're gonna go um, for the most part like where we're gonna cater out from 
what the uh, clubbies are going to provide if it's a if it's a clubby that's been there um, for the past few years. Um, I've also I try and send out uh, uh, if you if you want to call it an expectations email to each clubby um, for our first road trip. Like, hey, these are the things we expect to be provided for us. Um, you know, just like your basic things, you know, it's not, it's nothing, um, you know, grabbing in by any means, but like, these are the basics. And then from there, like, we're like, we're always going to need apples, oranges, bananas. Like we need that no matter what, because there are things that I like to bring out into the dugout, um, during the game. Um, you know, we're always going to need some bread, peanut butter and jelly because it's, you know, it's always a great backup plan regardless. Like, um, and then from there, get creative with, with whatever else you want. You want to, Put out pretzels and peanut butter go ahead if you're not that kind of guy and you want to put out like a fruit or a cheese spread go ahead like we need the basics we expect there to be like pretty much like a, a full replenishment of that when we need it um and then from there whatever you want to do to get creative um you know I, communication with the club is huge um and i think you can pick up a lot of uh you know, kind of brownie points of the clubby too. I feel like sometimes clubbies think everybody's out to get them or to try and screw them out of some money on the back end. So having like an open communication, like, hey, you know, this is what we expect. Like, you know, I'm going to be doing this. We hope that you'd be able to do this. Um, you know, we'll pick, we'll meet in the middle with everything else. And, you know, I also try and help out. I think um, helping out with a little bit of like, clubby stuff can help you on the back end too when it comes time to get a little bit of something um so you know just kind of like tidying up at the end of the day you know I, I try and put the chairs back up in the in the lockers and things like that when we can um because I think it goes I think it's respected by the clubby a little bit more and I think he's going to kind of put out a little bit more for us um or go a little bit further when we ask him like hey can you run to the store and get like a couple more um cartons of strawberries because we're running low or whatever. Um, yeah, for me, the, the thing is like, we talk about, we talked about, you know, the bad clubbies and everything, but I've heard a lot of horror stories of clubbies in the leagues I've been in. And I, I haven't had issues with them because like Joe said, you, if you reach out ahead of time and Goldie had mentioned it too, like if you reach out ahead of time and tell them your expectations, and hey, can you just work with us on this? And if you build a good relationship with the clubby, they'll do extra stuff for you. Even if it is quote unquote, the, the bad clubby in the league, they'll make an extra run for you. Um, or they'll stay a little bit later or get a little earlier. And like, if you just give them some good, honest feedback and you don't blow them up. Like we said, we don't like being blown up about the food. And, and I know they don't either. If you go up to them like this food sucks, it's unacceptable. And you're in their face. Like, that's not productive, but if you can sit down with them and like, Hey, next time we come into town, maybe we can try this instead of that. Like most of them are pretty receptive to it. If you just communicate with them, um, let your expectations be known ahead of time and all of that good stuff. And then the other thing for me that we haven't touched on yet that I actually think has helped me a lot is just communicating with the other strength coaches in the league. And, you know, Joe's been in his league a while. So if there's somebody new in his league, like, it would behoove them to reach out to him. Hey, you've been going to this same affiliate for a couple of years. Like, what do you guys do for food in this city? Um, you know, last year was my first year in AAA, and I, I talked to a lot of guys that I had already known. Like, hey, when we're here, what do you guys do? Like, what kind of food does your club eat provide? Is it good? Do I need to get outside stuff? If I get outside stuff, where can I go? And, um, I mean, I know we're all competing with each other, but at the end of the day, in the minor leagues especially, we're all just trying to develop guys and move them up. And, you know, if I can help Goldie out at his affiliate or he can help me out at my affiliate, like that's a win for everybody. And that's one less headache that we have to deal with. Um, and so I think reaching out to other strength coaches and just kind of getting some insight from them has really helped me a lot as well uh, also. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and then another thing too, like, we talk about the education, like the infographics, whatever it may be, you know, agendas or meal plans you, you throw up there. Um, I know this is kind of like a little abstract, but sometimes when you try to put things in another language, like try to reach out to the Latin guys so that they understand stuff, that's another way to build uh, buying in certain capacities as well. So just trying to 
you know, be an advocate for their learning as well, even though it's a different language. If you just try, if you just show them that you're trying to communicate with them, uh, they respect you a little bit more for that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, to build upon that, we have little um, infographs on different uh, supplements and also just like nutritional tips and sleep tips for for guys and we usually post them in the bathrooms because you you close the door stall door if you're at the urinal like it's right in front of you so you end up reading it anyway and we post them in both english and spanish around the clubhouse and throughout the facilities and stuff so they they're exposed to it and they can read it on their own time yeah I, this just kind of pops in my head um throwing, throwing guys a bone to be during throwing all of this is uh i think can get you a good amount of buy-in too like it's okay every once in a while to order, you know, to get some cookies that go along with the with the post game, um, you know, or you know, in our league we have um, BJs at a couple of places we go to, so you know they got the the little mini pizookies. Like every once in a while, if you can if you can somehow squeeze it into your budget just to throw them a bone, something like that to show them that you're still a human um, and not this kind of like nutrition Nazi. Uh, I, I think it helps and goes a long way, you know. Like, hey, it, it it might only happen once a month, but if you throw it out there, guys come in, they're like, there's ice cream sandwiches today. It, like, it goes a long way. You know, it just shows them, like, hey, we're not, like, evil when it comes to nutrition. You know, it's not always spinach and broccoli and stuff like that. Yeah, well, like we talked about, it's it's bodybuilding eating versus performance eating and athlete eating, and so every once in a while you can sneak those in. I I, I mean I've been in clubhouses to be honest that had like the Nutty Buddies and like Klondike bars and ice cream sandwiches and like with the but when we got there I didn't know it was going to be there. It was my first time there, and obviously the clubby hadn't told me like, hey, I got ice cream on hand. Is that okay? And within the first hour we were there, like the, the freezer was empty of ice cream. And I was like, yeah, we can't do that uh, the rest of the series, please. Like, I, I appreciate it. But like, when guys see that, they just go crazy and they eat the ice cream. So like, there was their one time for the month with the ice cream or whatever. <laughs> but uh, let's not restock the freezer, please. <laughs> and thank you. But yeah, it's I mean, it's really amazing. Like if you if you give them something like that just once in a while and they're like, oh, okay, this guy's not a robot. He actually enjoys like, you know, eating a little bit differently. Sometimes it's not all just chicken and rice and broccoli. And like you said, there, there is a limit to it and you have to be, it, you don't want to be the guy that has too much feel and you don't want to be the guy that doesn't <laughs> feel like you got to meet in the middle somewhere on everything. I, I mean, on stretch and conditioning and, and strength training and stuff, but especially with the food, like, if it's healthy all the time, I mean, I've heard stories of like managers buying food for the team because they were tired of just only having healthy options. And like, you don't want it to get to that because if the manager's against you on the food, then you're really, really doomed. But there is that kind of sweet spot that you can find that, that you can sneak those in. But I'm jealous that you have many pazookies every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one of the things we used to do was, you know, when we find guys for, you know, not showing up to the weight room or not showing up to stretch on time, things like that. You know, some of our managers, you know, we would find the guys and then, you know, at the end of the month or so, you know, there'd be, you know, a pot of, you know, extra dollars to kind of tack onto the spread. And so it kind of goes back, you know, to kind of like, you know, allowing them to kind of be empowered, like, yeah, they're late and all this stuff, but essentially it goes back to them in some way, shape or form to help them out. So I thought that was one of the things that was pretty cool that we did was, you know, every now and again, when guys, you know, would mess up and we'd get to a point where there's like, all right, now we have an extra 250 bucks of fine money. You know, let's go ahead and tack on, you know, some some extra treats for the guys, you know, going on the road trip or whatnot. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, guys, I appreciate you coming on. Before we get off, I just want uh, final closing statements from you guys. Anything that, you know, people haven't been listening for this entire episode, the things that you want them to take away from this. Uh, just be an advocate for performance, your athletes, um, and, and yourself at the end of the day. Um, your athletes' expectations are going to be derived from what you put forward uh, as a person and as a strength coach. I know we're not registered dietitians or nutritionists, but, you know, we will tap into those avenues just because we care. 
Um, and I think that goes along with uh, having a purpose with everything that you do, uh, not necessarily about passion, but make it about purpose, you know, and our purpose is to serve the athletes. Um, and we're going to do that in any way we can. Um, so just be an advocate for yourself, your athletes, um, and being a performance coach. Uh, for me, I think one thing is we need to be able to just come with an open mind and, and, you know, open ears and listen to an athlete that comes to you for help. Um, yes, we want to educate as much as we can, but sometimes I think we can get caught up in getting too pushy in it. So, you know, if an athlete genuinely has a question, then, you know, that should be a plus for you because he trusts you enough to, to come with an issue. Um, just make sure that you, you hear them out first and then, you know, give them your two cents and then lead them down another avenue where he can, you know, ask more questions later down the road or find the answers for himself, whether you give him resources to, to look up or to another person that may be a little bit more better versed than you in that subject. Yeah, for me, final, uh, final thoughts is really, you know, it's a collaborative approach between you and, and each one of your athletes and every one of your athletes is different. Um, you know, they're going to have different tastes and, you know, come from different backgrounds and things like that. And I think sometimes we, we get pegged as this, uh, you know, nutrition dictator. Um, so I think it goes a long way if you were able to sit down and, and really discuss things on a, on an individual basis with your athletes and figure out ways that, uh, you know, you can meet in the middle on things to, to take small steps forward in the right direction so that I can ultimately uh, help them with their, with their performance and with their careers. Awesome. All great things, guys. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, stay safe and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank All right. You. Thanks. All right, everybody, that concludes our episode with Joe, Jordan and Goldie. I hope you enjoyed this one. As I said earlier in the episode, I thought it was only right that although we have already done this topic of nutrition at the affiliates, it was with some other strength coaches who are at higher levels in the system. Uh, and so I thought it was only right to have some coaches who are working at the lower affiliate levels and just kind of go over some of the differences that they experience and some of the, the difficulties that they have in some of the smaller cities they're in and, and limited choices and things like that. And so I hope you were able to take some other things from this one in addition to the first one that we did about nutrition at the affiliates. Three things that I took from the guys in this episode, eat real food first and use supplements to supplement your diet. Eat balanced, complete meals first and in terms of creating buy-in, practice what you preach with nutrition. Um, before we end the episode, I just want to give one more shout out to our sponsors, all of the all-star sponsor companies. Those are Momentus, Woodway, Aura Ring, Garden of Life, Direct Fitness Solutions, Proven 4, and Clean Athlete. Thank you again to all of those companies for sponsoring all of the PBS CCS events. Uh, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and we'll talk to you on the next one.